that a huge untapped oil field probably lay directly under the Oklahoma City city limits excited all of the major oil companies. The dampener was that the Oklahoma City zoning ordinances prohibited drilling within most of the city. And no one knew whether the city would be willing to change the law. The Phillips Petroleum Company had, like city service, leased a great deal of acreage outside the city limits, but it also wanted a crack at what was inside. Then Phillips sent a senior executive to Oklahoma City to study the matter. Later, he reported his findings at a board meeting, saying that there was no way the zoning extension would be improved. Mr. Phillips said, well, then we are through uh, uh, with Oklahoma City. Anything else? He turned to me and he said, what do you think about that, Kenneth? And I said, well, I don't agree with the decision at all. I'm sure that an oil extension that can be approved. And uh, Mr. Phillips said, uh, well, he said, uh, if you think that, he said, you go down there and get it approved. So I left that afternoon and took about uh, eight to ten of our top young men heading up our geological land department and some good land buyers, and uh, we went down and stayed at the Skirvin Hotel and uh, took one whole floor. And uh, I was going through the Chamber of Commerce uh, roster to see if there's an oil man that was a member of the Chamber of Commerce. And the only man that was listed was uh, Bob Kerr, uh, and it stated that he is with the uh, Kerr Anderson Drilling Company. I never met uh, Mr. Kerr at that time. But I did call him at home that evening, called him at home and asked him if he wouldn't come down to the Skirvin Hotel and have a discussion with me about a very important matter that uh, Phelps was interested in. And he came down and I told him what our problem was and uh, whether or not he would not uh, uh, head up the uh, Oklahoma City Oil Extension Association. So uh, he decided that he would take it. And uh, from then on, why... Uh, he did a great job. He organized all of the uh, uh, four precincts and, uh, in Oklahoma City. I think there were four. And uh, uh, the election was held within a period of about six to seven months. And that gave Phillips an opportunity and to spend uh, several million dollars in buying leases on the land from the city limits on north to the Capitol building. And at that time, Mr. Phelps thought that uh, we were taking an awful big gamble and we were spending a lot of money and uh, there was a tremendous possibility that uh, the extension would not go through and it would be lost. But uh, we uh, uh, employees that had been working on it, we were sold to the top on, on the program. Well, the vote passed, and it not only made the Phillips Petroleum Company a major organization, it also led to Boots Adams becoming president of Phillips and then its chairman. Working in the Oklahoma City field at the same time was John Houchin. He too would later lead the Phillips Company. By then, the town was covered with big steel derricks, and gusher after gusher was roaring in. Down in East Texas, they were also having a great oil bonanza. And suddenly, America found itself with something new, too much oil, and the price collapsed. When the first Oklahoma City well came in, in December 1928, oil was selling for $1.56 a barrel. Two and a half years later, in a glutted market, it was down to 83 cents a barrel, then to a quarter. That led to efforts to bring equilibrium to the industry and the theory of proration, oil allowance. And in those early days, out front, outrageously, was Oklahoma's flamboyant governor, Alfalfa Bill Murray. Bill Murray was in his first year as governor, and he had just come through a stormy session of the legislature. And Bill Murray was a man of action, and he loved to do the spectacular and the theatrical. So on August the 4th, 1931, he issued his uh, proclamation for martial law, closing down all 
the uh, oil wells in Oklahoma except the strippers. Now that order applied to uh, 3,106 producers. In Oklahoma City is them and other fields. And Bill Murray, of course, being the student of constitutional law that he was, uh, took delight in drafting that order himself and he imposed martial law in a radius of 50 feet around each well. And he put his cousin Cicero Murray in charge. Cicero was made a lieutenant colonel in the National Guard. The National Guard was charged with enforcing the order. And Cicero Murray became what we call in newspaper business the oil czar. He was charged with closing these wells and seeing that the orders were preserved. Now that was Bill Murray's way of suspending the writ of habeas corpus within that small area of uh, 50 feet around each well. And uh, the order was effective. Now the oil men, of course, uh, well, some of them took it jokingly, but uh, by and large, I think they were pretty much in sympathy with old Bill in uh, closing down the fields because uh, the, the price of oil had made it uh, unprofitable to produce. And so the, the, the military was in charge until November of that year. Of course, uh, uh, several thousand oil field workers were thrown out of work temporarily. Uh, but then, as the market demand increased, the companies were permitted to start production again, and the oil workers were not out of employment for a very long time, and uh, they were back on the jobs. There was no, it was the one thing that Bill Murray did that didn't stir up too much controversy. I mean, Bill Murray was a controversial character, uh, but by and large, he had general support of the public and the oil industry. So, in 1932, the price of oil started climbing, not rapidly, but sure and steady. In Oklahoma City, about 500 wells were in production, the city receiving a $1,000 drilling permit from each. The oil field not only provided employment for thousands of people, it also gave to the homeowners on the poor east side of the town where most of the oil was hundreds of thousands of dollars in lease rights to say nothing of the vast royalties that would come later. The Depression was on in America, but there were no soup lines in Oklahoma City. By 1935, the Capitol grounds were completely surrounded by derricks. None were on the grounds themselves. Alfalfa Bill Murray had seen to that. But E.W. Marlin was governor now, and he had a different idea. Marlin was an oil man. He had made $100 million, but lost it. Then he had turned to politics, serving first as a congressman, now as governor. Marlin knew enough about oil to know that the wells surrounding the Capitol were bleeding off oil located directly under the Capitol grounds. Marlin thought that oil belonged to the state, and he wanted to lease that property for one quarter royalty on every drop of oil. Not everybody liked the idea. Nearby residents didn't want derricks overlooking their property. Other people thought the derricks would spoil the beauty of the capital. Actually, Marlin cared more and knew more about beauty and landscaping than any of his critics. And earlier, at his own expense, had shipped huge quantities of shrubbery from his mansion in Ponca City to help landscape the capital. Quite simply, Marlin thought that the proceeds from oil would benefit the state more than beautiful gardens. So, a battle developed between Marlin and the city. The city refused to include the state-owned lands on a ballot for a zoning election to grant leases. Marlin then grew impatient and declared the capital grounds an area of martial law and leased the land to oil companies as National Guardsmen stood by. Oklahoma City authorities said that I could not drill these wells, but they granted foreign oil corporations permits to drill right up against our land and take our oil. In order to protect the interests of the state, that state land, I declared martial law and ordered out a squad of the National Guard to prevent civil authorities from interfering with our operation. The city attempted to enjoin me in the lower court, 
But the Supreme Court upheld my contention. So now everything is okay. The oil is out. Marlin won the battle, and the state capitol complex got other buildings, all paid for by oil royalties. One other oil-related event distinguished Marlin's term as governor, the founding of the Interstate Oil Compact Commission. He had the plan in his platform for governor, promising that never again would competing boom field excesses be allowed to drop the price of crude oil to 25 cents a barrel. After he was elected, he invited the governors from six oil-producing states to meet in Ponca City, his home. There was disagreement, but Marlin pulled it off, bringing about an agreement that was eventually signed by 21 states. With two years remaining in his term of office, Marlin decided to run for the Senate in 1936 and lost. He ran again in 1938 and lost again. He then returned to Ponca City with his young wife to live in what was once part of a garage of his estate. He was looking for oil, hoping to make a comeback when he died a broken man in 1941. This was one of the favorite songs that year. Changing the weather, changing the sea. From now on, there'll be a change in me. My walk will be different, my talk and my name. Nothing about me is going to be the same. Major Bowes was big on radio. At seven year old, Shirley Temple was the nation's choice in the movies. She helped take people's mind off the depression. So did Mae West. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, Gary Cooper. Popular books were Life with Father and the new sensation that would sell a million copies in six months, Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, which had created the NRA, the WPA, the TVA, and the CCC, was going to be opposed that year by Alf Landon. Only Maine and Vermont would fail to vote for Roosevelt for four more years. It was 1936. There'll be some changes made. A critical year for the Kerr-Anderson Drilling Company of Oklahoma City. The partners were Robert S. Kerr and his brother-in-law, James Anderson. Now, the company had had moderate success as a drilling contractor in both the Oklahoma City and Greater Seminole fields. But in 1936, Anderson sold his partnership to Kerr and decided to retire. Kerr didn't want to run the company. Even then, he was leaning towards the concept of public service. And of course, eventually would become governor and later United States Senator. But in 1936, he needed a key executive to run the company. Where to find him? Well, he looked to Bartlesville and his old friend, Boots Adams, and asked for help. Reluctantly, Adams agreed for the two men he chose to send to help Kerr were two of the most gifted employees of the Phillips Petroleum Company, and one was a young, remarkable geologist who in time would have his name alongside Kurz. And that association would lead to this. Well, I did uh, go to work for Phillips Petroleum out of college. And uh, I was here in the Oklahoma City oil field in the uh, uh, boom days in the 1930, 31, 32. And then, uh, ended up in Bartersville uh, and uh, became the chief geologist of the company. Uh, and in 1937, uh, uh, Robert Lynn and uh, myself uh, uh, left Phillips and uh, uh, joined uh, Bob Kerr in the, uh, what was then the Curlin Oil Company and also the uh, 
Sterling Drilling Company. And uh, Mr. Lynn uh, continued with the company until uh, uh, 1942, at which time he left to, uh, to go in business for himself as an independent operator. And uh, I've continued on, of course, with the company since then. What was uh, Senator Kerr's uh, attitude towards running the business? I think you could describe the, uh, the senator's role in those early years as, uh, as being the uh, as a being a moving force in the company, a great optimist. And uh, uh, so far as he was concerned, uh, uh, opportunities were, were unlimited. And I'm sure if somebody would have asked him at that time how big the company would be by now, he, he might have said two or three times what the size of it is. Uh, he, uh, he always approached everything from the standpoint of it being uh, something that could be done. <laughs> Kermagee refers to itself today as a natural resources company, for in addition to petroleum, it is deeply involved in gas and coal, and is one of the nation's largest producers of nuclear energy. Kermagee has made remarkable progress in the last 40 years. Its assets are in excess of $800 million. Its net income last year was more than $50 million, an increase of nearly 25% over 1971. The company is involved in petroleum exploration and development in Texas, Oklahoma, the Gulf of Mexico, the Middle East. Kermagee also has interests in agricultural and industrial chemicals and wood products. It is headquartered in a brand new skyscraper in downtown Oklahoma City, which is called the McGee Tower. Today, 45 years after its discovery, the Oklahoma City oil field has produced more than 735 million barrels of oil and is still producing 5,300 barrels a day. The major operators are Phillips, City Service, and Sun DX. It is hard to visualize Oklahoma City without its oil derricks. They make it probably the most quickly identifiable state capital in the country. When they went up within the city limits, the New York Times said that Oklahoma City had chosen money over beauty. And even now, that opinion is still shared by many people who live here. If they had their way, the derricks would come down. So why are they still up? It's cheaper to keep them up than take them down. There was some sentiment a few years ago to pressure the oil companies to remove them, but it didn't amount to much. It seems probable, though, that when the oil finally plays out, practically all of the derricks will come down. The only ones likely to be standing in the years ahead are probably three or four around the state capitol. And they will be there only as historical reminders of a robust, tempestuous period that conditioned the growth of Oklahoma City. And what better way to remember? Well, that's our show for this month. We hope you enjoyed it. We invite you to join us next month, next year, actually, for Oklahoma January. Until then, thank you, and good night.